Hello, everyone, and welcome to another detailed diatribe where today I am joined by Red. Hello. Uh, I'm sure you're dying to know what I'm drinking today. It's bottled raspberry tea. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. We're breaking the bounds of podcast bits and bringing it onto the channel. I mean, who Fantastic. could resist such a such a juicy bit with so much potential for It it is literally a juicy bit because it's just drinks. Hey. -oh. <laughs> we're we're both sick this week. We're allowed to <laughs> <laughs> It's fine. <laughs> uh, no, we we live. We have fun. Uh today uh, this is very exciting. We are doing a detailed diatribe on Drake's final treasure in Uncharted 4, A Thief's End. And this is part of the one final scene collaboration. We are joining with our buddy Nando V Movies for one last ride on this big mega collab train where a bunch of different creators uh, are doing videos for this. There'll be a playlist linked down below for all the others. They're always super, super fun. Uh, this is the fifth and final year of the one blank scene collab, and they've always been such a blast. So thank you to Nando for putting this on and for including us in all of these and we're so very excited to present this for you today. Yeah. So, Red, what are we talking about? We're talking about Uncharted, Woo! Naughty Dog's 2007 debut of one of the best series on the, the Sony PlayStation that ever existed as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> uh, the premise began very simply, which is what if Indiana Jones but game? <laughs> and it was good as hell! It, it wasn't, like, the best thing ever, but it was a really great start for something that would become truly fantastic in a decade's time. And 2007, for context, is one of the best years in gaming history. It was absolutely stacked with all of your favorite games. We got Mario Galaxy, Bioshock, Whoa. Halo 3, Call of Duty 4, Crisis, Uncharted, Team Fortress 2, Mass Effect, The Witcher, Guitar Hero, Portal, um, God of War 2, Rock Band, uh, Zelda Phantom Hourglass, Assassin's Creed, Half-Life 2 Episode 2, uh, Orange Box, Lego Star Wars, Metroid Prime 3, so many of the good games came out this year. It's kind of insane. It was the first full generation of the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3. Oh. So uh, Uncharted is in a, a very August graduating class uh, that year. <laughs> Not relevant to the detailed diatribe, just an important factoid that I love sharing whenever I get the chance, because 2007 was nuts. Yeah, yeah. just really want to highlight so. that Uncharted is good, but also it's good in comparison to other games that are good. <laughs> it's not only good, it's better than all these other trash games. <laughs> Halo 3, more like Halo P. Get out of here. <laughs> oh, the energy we're bringing today. <laughs> we're both sick and we're having a blast. Yeah. But also, uh, this happens to be my favorite love story in video games. And that's no. something that I really want to share today, uh, specifically with uh, what, what we're talking about here in the context of, of one final scene. Uh, since Uncharted 1, the core of the story was this relationship between protagonist Nathan Drake and Elena Fisher. And we're going to talk about it, because from the very first scene of Uncharted 1 to the very last scene of Uncharted 4, there's there's quite a journey they go on. And I, I wanted to talk about this since basically the beginning of us doing detailed diatribes. Yeah, that makes and sense. And even going further back, like, after I finished Uncharted 4 for the first time in 2016 when it came out, I was like, oh, I want to make a video about this, but I do not know how. So it was a <laughs> long time coming, but... We're finally here. Yeah, that makes I mean, Uncharted is definitely one of those series that has lived rent-free in your head uh, since mm -hmm. first playthrough. Uh, any game that influences your entire wardrobe for years to come is, is probably a uh, contender for detailed diatribe. <laughs> Yeah, seriously. I mean, given that, you know, the Henley look is full sail borrowed from uh, Nathan Drake, and one year I dressed up as him for Halloween with, like, the ring on a string necklace and just never stopped. Yep. And that is currently where my engagement ring is hanging around my neck. Yep. Um, clearly, this is a formative experience for me. I'm <laughs> once again showing my whole ass in the process of bringing this detailed diatribe to you. First Spider-Man, now this. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> the two are linked in more ways than one, as hey. we will see. Um, so we begin uh, with Uncharted 1, very familiar fun. Uh, the game, uh, subtitled Drake's Fortune, is a pretty straightforward treasure hunting fair. It's very much like we're doing Indiana Jones, but a video game, and we've got some idea of like what else we're bringing to this. But it's it's pretty comfortable. It's not derivative in, in, in any way, but it's it's comfortable. It's a lot of dynamics you come to expect. Mm. The way that Nate and Elena are portrayed is 
Nothing terribly groundbreaking, but it's well done. Drake is this smart-ass, completely untrustworthy, hotshot protagonist guy. Elena is a clever journalist who sees right through him at every point and is able to kind of like catch him on his bullshit. Hmm. Uh, since the first scene where he tries to pull one over on her, she's like, oh no, you're not doing that again. <laughs> uh, they, they banter, they have a fun time. This opening sequence here is um, Elena shooting this documentary for her show, and Drake is like, this is the coffin of Sir Francis Drake. As you can see, it's going to be empty, and he opens it up, and it's empty. It's not actually him, and it's like, oh, there's this journal with a map that leads to El Dorado, yada, yada, yada. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, and then Drake is like, all right, put the camera away. She's like, what What do you mean? He's like, I told you I'd get you the coffin. I didn't tell you I'd get you anything else. So they have this very fun dynamic <laughs> immediately, but it's not It's not crazy complicated. It's just good fun. It's, it's just a nice little tropey time. It's, you could say that this game design is perhaps good. <laughs> Perhaps good. Per perhaps <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll see more of that. All yeah. Right, all right. Um, they they both get to be smart and and get the the one up on each other. There's a sequence where uh, Nate and his uh, his his older mentor figure Sully are basically deciding to ditch Elena um, so that she doesn't like get the scoop and uh, they can just go and get the treasure by themselves. So they're in this boat and Elena's on the dock like, yeah, no, I don't trust these guys, but I need to go with them. And then they just like peel off and sail <laughs> away. And she's like, what the fuck? And eventually she <laughs> catches up to them later. Uh, a, a very fun sequence of, of uh, beats between them that that kind of point to the start of something more interesting than just kind of like the Indiana Jones and female character dynamic they, they set up at the start. Um, most notably, there's the sequence where Drake is like, all right, we got to get the hell out of here. Like, this is insane. They're, you know, mercenaries crawling all over the island. Drake wants to bail and Elena refuses. And he says, I can't have your bullet riddled corpse on my conscience. And she says, oh, please, you quit if you want, but don't use me as an excuse. <laughs> and that becomes a very important dynamic as the series progresses where, like, Drake plays the tough guy, but he has some some fragility behind that, uh, that macho demeanor he portrays. And at the end of the game, they have the sequence where, you know, he rescues her, they're about to kiss, and Sully comes up on a boat from, from the side and is like, you two got a funny idea or romantic. <laughs> it's it's just, it's a fun time. Uh, yeah. It's a little more interesting than the usual tropey fare, but it doesn't get too far beyond it. It's fun, it's comfortable, it didn't set the world on fire, but it was the start of great things to come later. Nice. I don't think I've ever played this one. I think uh, my only experience with Uncharted has mostly been Uncharted 4, and uh, when uh, Troy Baker and Nolan North were doing a Let's Play series of Uncharted a yeah. little bit. Uh, the definitive playthroughs, those were so fun. Yeah, yeah. So that's my, my only exposure to Uncharted 1 through 3 has been through like YouTube cutscene movies and like commentary Let's Playthroughs and the voice actors shooting the <laughs> while they played. So that's all I yeah. got. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good way to experience it, especially when you get basically the, the experience of the definitive playthrough yeah. with uh, with Troy and Nolan, where you get to hear them talk mm. about stuff and banter and share stories. I'll, I'll link that down below because it is really fun. If uh, if you've played it before or if you haven't, watching that is is one of the best ways to experience it. Yeah. Uh, it is truly such a good time. And they bring in guests as well. Really great experience. Um, thank you for reminding me of that because that is such a fun <laughs> little little YouTube treasure that uh, that more people should know about. Yeah, absolutely. We then get to Uncharted. 2, which is a lot of people's favorite uh, until Uncharted 4, um, but 2 was uh, hugely uh, impactful in the industry. It made a massive splash. It begins with a time skip, implied to be two years. Uh, you know, the time between the games is kind of time in the games right. as well. Yeah. Uh, no Elena is in sight. Uh, the implication is that after the events of the first game, they kind of had a bit of a fling, but then Nate went back to treasure hunting and kind of left Elena behind. And they only cross paths in this game when they are both on the trail of the big bad guy, Zoran Bad Guy Lazarevich, uh, where Elena is reporting on him because he's a war criminal, <laughs> and Drake is following him because they're on the hunt for the same magic artifact, the Chintamani Stone, as a whole. MacGuffin. Oh, yeah. Uh, and Elena is the one who figures out, like, hey, this guy's rich. If it's just a big sapphire, he wouldn't want it. Clearly, there's something else going on here. So she's the one who starts to put the pieces together that there's more afoot than just, oh, it's it's a treasure. And that, of course, becomes a theme that the treasure is never just the treasure. It's usually magic and kills you. <laughs> and after a, a daring escape sequence, um, they kind of get back into the familiar dynamic when it's them against the world where Elena says, okay, let's go. And Nate says, oh, no, 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 you're not coming coming with me. And Elena says, Nate, shut up, okay? We have a train to catch. And then they, they go over <laughs> to uh, to go do this whole, you know, action sequence they go after later. So again, it's following from Uncharted 1 where Drake is like, this sucks, let's get out of here. And Elena's like, don't you coward out of this now. We got to follow this through. You know, I, writing wise, I think, because uh, when you said this is like Indiana Jones book game, I think that kind of helped focus in on exactly what separates this 
particular style of relationship writing from the way that the Indiana Jones movies write their relationship between Indy and uh, woman of the movie, which is that in those ones, Indy tends to be the one that like facilitates the plot and brings it to the uh, female lead. Like he's, you know, he's like hunting it down and it loops her into it. And then she's kind of along for the ride. Whereas in this case, it seems like Nathan Drake is pretty much always doing the same gimmick, which is big treasure. I want to get it. And then Elaine is the one who comes in with the context and the, oh, here's actually what's going on here. And here's why this is a bigger deal than just big treasure, big payday, which I think does a lot to sort of balance out their roles in the story and make it feel a little bit more like a relationship between equals who are like very dissimilar in a lot of ways, but are both contributing like 50% of the plot where like Nate is driving the plot with like big treasure I want. And Elaine is the one who's bringing in all the lore and like, here's what's actually going on and is actually yeah. curious about it. Yeah, there's a, a really interesting dynamic between them where they are both very smart, but in different axes. So mm. Drake is a treasure hunter with deep knowledge of history and an Uncharted One is able to read uh, 15th century Spanish just out of hand. He's like, oh, here's a shipping manifest. They've got this, this, and this. And Elena's like, what the f*** are you doing? <laughs> Whereas Elena is a very talented investigator who is able to make those kinds of logical leaps, very like Batman-y detective, putting the things together. And their skill sets combine to synthesize information in a way where one of them on their own wouldn't have been able to figure it out. And that exact dynamic that you're talking about, Red, plays mm -hmm. out multiple times across the games. There are other characters who they, they interact with, Sully, of course, but also in Uncharted 2, there's Chloe, who's kind of the the other side of this love triangle, you know, Nate's old flame that he goes back to, right. uh, and they do heists together. And they are clearly, you know, good at teamwork, and they work together well, and they want the same things most of the time when they're not, you know, double-crossing each other. <laughs> but the, the relationship between Nate and Chloe and Nate and Elena is characterized very differently. Uh, uh, where Elena kind of busts Drake's chops more often, but has his interests in mind more so than Chloe does, where it's like, I'll heist with you so long as it's good for me. Mm. And pairing those two together is a great way to show in this game, like, yeah, it's not just that, you know, Nate's a guy and Elena's a girl and they're going to kiss. It's like <laughs> they have a personal chemistry that's more than they think each other are hot because Nate and Chloe think each other are hot. And they even <laughs> say as much at the end of the game, Chloe says, face it, you're going to miss this ass, which is hilarious. <laughs> but there, there, there's more with the Drake and Elena relationship that... The, the comparisons serve to, uh, to to flesh out nicely. So That's really cool. People like Uncharted 2 for good reasons. Yeah. It, it's a fun one. They, they do a good job. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, the plot continues. Nate and Chloe each have another moment of, actually, screw this, I quit. Uh, <laughs> but when they find the lost city of uh, Shambhala, they eventually get there. Uh, Chloe's like, this is insane. We're leaving. And Nate and, uh, and Elena are like, no, absolutely not. We have to kill this guy. We're, we're going to stick through this. This We're not going to leave now. So um, Elaine is the catalyst for Nate being like, okay, I, I do have to do this. And then together, Nate and Elaine are the catalyst for Chloe being, okay, I, I do in fact have to do this. So they're, 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 they're a very good team in reinforcing heroic impulses within each other. Right. Um, there's a, a dramatic sequence at the end where Elena takes a grenade to the torso. Um, and at the very end of the game in the sequence here on the screen, uh, she's like, so how scared were you that I was going to die? And Nate kind of thinks about it for a second and says, four. She's like, four? <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I, I knew you'd be fine. It's like, oh, my God, no. You were crying. He's like, no, 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 no. It was raining and you were unconscious. And Elena says, it was sunny and you were bawling your eyes out. It's a very funny sequence of them giving each other a gentle ribbing. But underneath that is the layer of they do genuinely care about each other and they wouldn't be making those kinds of jokes um, if they didn't. So it kind of ends on this like, hey, you know, they got together kind of thing. There's gestures towards like, oh, you know, tell her you love her, but nothing really comes of it in, in, in that sense. Right. Um, but it's just a, a, a nice, fun story that lets these characters have a bit more deep of a relationship than they had in Uncharted 1. And it's a reason people love this game so much. It's just, it's good, it's fun, and it's much more involved than any of the other uh, games, even in, in similar, you know, corners of the genre had done up until that point. That's adorable. I have a real soft spot for, like, the character in Crisis is terrified other character's gonna die, and then later the other character just relentlessly makes fun of them for it. <laughs> it's like, ah, yeah, oh, you great. care about me, and if I die, it's like, no, shut up, whatever. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So then another two-year timescape, we come to Uncharted 3, which I think is most people's least favorite 
of the bunch for various reasons. Uh, and we can kind of get into a little bit of that with how the relationship between Drake and Elena applies to that and, and points towards something really interesting that doesn't quite come together the way that the developers or the story writers might have wanted to, because this game, much more than one or two, feels like its focus is a bit split. It has by far the most dramatic set pieces with the whole, like, falling out of the plane thing. Oh yeah, that was three. And all the chases in the desert and all a bunch of really cool stuff in this whole cruise ship that's exploding. It's It's got a lot of big dramatic moments. However, it doesn't necessarily fit with the story all that well, and you get the sense that, and I, I don't know if I, I heard this from that playthrough of um, mm. of Troy Baker and Nolan North talking about how they came up with a lot of the uh, set pieces first and then kind of wrote a story around it. I don't know if that is specifically true, but that is kind of what it feels like, much more so than in Uncharted 1 or 2, where it's like, yeah, no, this, like, the 1 to 2 to 3 of where everything's going, like, you know, point A, point B, point C, Lost City, it all flows, it makes sense, it fits with the story. In Uncharted 3, it doesn't really feel like that, mm. um, which kind of lets the, the plot down, uh, unfortunately. So, I remember in the first one, it was El Dorado, which turned out to be a secret zombie plague, and then in the second one, it was Shambhala and, like, the, the tree and the, like, elixir of immortality. Yeah, the sap from the tree of life. Right. What's the third one, MacGuffin? This, the third one is essentially the final um, heist. It's called Drake's Deception. So the deception mm -hmm. is that Sir Francis Drake was on the hunt for the city Ubar, Iram of the Pillars, the legendary city in, somewhere in Arabia. Uh. And the historical account is he was like, oh, sorry, Queen Elizabeth, couldn't find it. And the deception is that he actually did know where it was, but Ooh. for some reason he turned back. He didn't, he didn't want to do it. And they're tracking it down and finding it. And then uh, about halfway through the plot, um, Chloe and another thief in the gang, Cutter, leave the story, and Elena steps into the plot to help uh, Nate and Sully get into this part of Yemen on, like, fake journalist passes that she uh, whips up for them. Hmm. Uh, and we learn that uh, Nate and Elena had gotten married after Uncharted 2, but at this point in the story are separated for vague, never really stated, but ultimately pretty guessable reasons. Hmm. Um, Elena helps them out at this point in the plot, mostly for Sully's sake, because they still are on very good terms, clearly. <laughs> um, and snidely accuses Drake of obsessing over this treasure and lying about it to her and to himself. So this is something that we uh, see for the first time in this story that really comes into play in Uncharted 4, where the motives that Drake has for chasing these treasures are not the most noble. Like, you're going to steal something. That yeah. <laughs> well, Fundamentally, there, there's something that is uh, greedy uh, about someone who wants to go out and find all this stuff. I agree, but I also think that there's this interesting layer to it that I know comes out in Uncharted 4, uh, which is like, like there's 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 layers here because top layer like most noble would be like oh man I'm really interested in like the archaeological and anthropological implications of this and like the history and stuff like that and then one level below it is like it's a big payday this is a big treasure and we can get tons of money and then one level below that is Drake has a problem and the problem is he cannot stop adventuring he he yeah. he loves the excitement <laughs> it's he loves puzzle solving he loves feeling smart he doesn't like getting shot at by men with guns but he likes the the he likes the adventure aspect of things and like he and I just think that's a really interesting angle for it because it, it like the most noble explanation would be like ideal but, but like even the greedy explanation like that's why Chloe does this and like even that would yeah. be a little bit understandable because then he could get a certain amount of like I've I'm comfortably set up for life this is great I can stop now once I have two lost cities I'll be satisfied yeah, but it becomes very <laughs> clear not to spoil any future slides but it becomes very clear in the beginning of Uncharted 4 that it's not actually about the money and it's not really no. about the treasure it's about Drake has a problem he, he, he's bored, and he really, really loves adventuring. It's like the Sherlock yeah. Holmes issue of, like, I'm so bored. Can someone get murdered already so I can figure it out? Like, and you, that's you pretty cool. much got it. Yeah, because I, I truly think that, like, uh, if, if it were just greedy, Elena would be like, come on, man. We have enough money. I have, a, like, a really, like, respectable paying job. Uh, but because it's Drake has a personal issue that he cannot confront about himself, Elena's like, all right, there's only so much I can do with that. Like, yeah. you're, you're not even being honest with yourself about why you're going on all these cool adventures. And um, this is, like, a little minor writing tangent, but this is something that I think a lot of stories kind of struggle with when it's, like, the, the, the awesome, cool adventure is actually representative of bad stuff, which is why the ideal end scenario is to never do this again. And it's like, oh, come on. But the Uncharted games, it really does kind of come across as like, 
look, parts of this are really fun. Parts of this are cool. It'd be great to do all the cool exploration later. Getting shot at by greedy men with guns or, like, you know, having to outrun scary mutant zombies. That part sucks. Yeah. Nobody likes that part. <laughs> Drake keeps trying to stop playing whenever that happens. Crap, uh, crap, crap, crap. Yeah, so when, when Nathan Drake, yeah. like, when we, the player, are like, no, I want there to be more fun adventures, it's like, well, the fun adventuring part was not the part where I was falling to my death or, you know, trying desperately to outrun scary Spaniard zombies or, uh, you know, incomprehensible Eldritch Horrors. Like, that part wasn't fun and I would be okay with not doing it again. And so when it's like, Drake, you have a problem that you keep putting yourself in these situations, it's like, yeah, man, maybe four games will be enough. <laughs> maybe we can <laughs> by, actually stop. By my my fourth Lost City, that's when I'll be able to stop. Lost <laughs> Cities, Drake, is an outlier and should not be counted. <laughs> but part of the reason for that, you're making a very good point, is uh, Uncharted 3 brings up for the first time the aspect of Nate having something to prove. It goes uh. back to a little bit of his childhood and him meeting Sully where he's this, you know, very, you know, Aladdin-esque kind of street rat Riff who's skulking street around museums. <laughs> uh, exactly. <laughs> and it's it's not just that he wants the money, he has to prove something about himself and his worth that, that drives him to do all this stuff and his relationship to Drake, uh, Sir Francis Drake and mm -hmm. sort of like fulfilling that uh, that model. There's there's a whole sequence uh, in the middle of the game where they find this clue uh, in the city in Yemen that, that points towards where Aram is. It's got all this stuff written by Drake in English like, turn back, Jesus f***ing Christ, do not go any further, we're done, get out of here, I burned all my notes and lied to the queen so no one would see what I saw. <laughs> and Drake is like, Amazing, we're going in the right direction. Elena's like, are you f***ing kidding me? What's wrong with you? Do you see, you see the sign that says Jesus f***ing Christ, stop, and you're like, great, let's keep going. You're a madman, Nathan. This is why we got divorced. And it, it's, it's genuinely a good scene. It, I'm putting words in Elena's right, mouth, yeah. but that, that is the tone that is taken in that sequence where Drake is like, let's go. And Elena's like, no. This is not a place of honor. Sign me up. <laughs> it can be. <laughs> How will we know if no highly esteemed deed is commemorated here if we don't check? <laughs> exactly. Uh, Elena is abundantly sick of Nate ignoring warnings and running into needless danger. In another scene, she says, you know, Sully would go to the ends of the earth for you. Don't ask him to. Um, and Drake, like, the gears kind of turn on that, but not enough. Um, there's there's a kind of funny scene that, that that sequence starts with Sully leaving to go grab some guns and then immediately Drake and Elena turn to each other and start bickering about stuff, which <laughs> is like, it's kind of funny, but also it's like, oh, yeah. Um, the choice to kind of have them get married and then set them back yields some interesting stuff and it, it gets to some cool character moments, but it, it ultimately doesn't quite work. It feels a little bit unearned because there's so much that's kind of pasted over mm. in that time gap that they don't really flesh out quite enough because they don't have the time. Elena's only in the back half of the story, so they can't do that much with her. But uh, the scene that I really like in this one is, is what's on screen here where Drake uh, gets captured. There's this whole sequence where he has to escape this pirate colony and then he has to get on this cruise ship and blow up the cruise ship and then he comes back to the same city in Yemen, which is like <laughs> this clearly was pasted from elsewhere in the storyboards. Ah. Um, th that's the read that I have. Um, but eventually he comes back and kind of stumbles in and he's tired and you know, beat to within an inch of his life. Uh, Elena had been making plans to go rescue Sully, who has independently gotten captured oh, while Drake great. was out getting captured. Uh, they find that Sully's getting moved into the desert with the bad guys who want to try to find the city because Sully knows where it is. They learned the lesson of don't mark where the lost city is on a map because that got them in trouble in Uncharted 2. So in this game, Drake is like, hey, Sully, can you remember this? He's like, yeah, but should we mark it down? He's like, no, we shouldn't. <laughs> so they end up capturing Sully instead, which is a cute like way to evolve the story. And it, it actually makes that that capture plot line make more sense. Yeah. Drake you know, stumbles into this room. Elena has this plan to go you know, rescue Sully on her own because she assumes that Drake is either captured or dead. Aww. And they're like, okay, so we have until tomorrow morning when this airplane leaves that we're going to try to catch at this airfield. But until then, like you're exhausted, you almost died, like, rest a little bit. So she, like, pulls him down, like, puts his head on her lap, lets him sleep, and Nate says, I like the way you think. And Elena says, I know. And as Drake's, like, kind of about to drift in and out of consciousness, he says, no, I mean, that's... And what he was going to say was, it's very noble of you to have gone out for Sully mm -hmm. at potentially great risk to yourself all by yourself. And Elena says, I know. 
There's another pause, and Drake says, I'm sorry. And Elena says, I know. And then it's Aww. it's a very sweet scene. Fade to black. They they have a little nap. They <laughs> they go on the airfield, do the rest of the plot, and all uh, ends up well. And the game has those moments that work, but overall it doesn't quite connect for anything. It wants to have this more mature and complex story. And they have all the pieces, or at least most of the pieces they would need for that, but they don't assemble it in a way that really makes it pop and feel like this big dramatic character drama. There's just too many set pieces going on and they don't really flow together. The way I describe it is the ingredients don't fit the recipe and I don't know if the recipe was wrong or the ingredients were wrong, but it just doesn't really come together. And the way that I'm describing it is kind of a generous read uh, <laughs> because I, I'm really pulling a lot from a small handful of scenes in the story. Gotcha. But uh, I, I do like that they tried something much more interesting on paper than, than what they did in Uncharted 1 or 2. It didn't work as well in execution, but the idea was very, very compelling of like what happens when we put these characters together, kind of break them a little bit and then throw them back uh, next to each other. How do they handle that? And in the end, what they do is that um, Nate loses his <laughs> his sick parwis magna, greatness from small beginnings, uh, Francis Drake's ring, uh, gets lost in a, in a whole sequence. Um, and uh, he's talking to Sully uh, at the very end uh, of the story on the airfield when they're all like done with everything. And Sully says, hey, kid, I've been holding on to this for a while, and it's Drake's wedding ring that he thought he lost. Aww. Yeah, and he pulls out the ring, and, and Nate says, oh, hold on, Sully, you're not proposing to me, are you? And <laughs> Sully says, Drake, shut up, stop being a smartass for once in your life, okay? Listen <laughs> to me. And he says, like, you know, it's not where we start that matters, it's where we end up and the choices we make. Very sweet scene. Hmm. So he goes over to, uh, over to Elena, and she says, hey, I'm sorry about your ring. He says, it's okay. I swapped it out for something better. He puts his hand on top of hers and he's wearing his wedding ring again. And it's like, oh, hooray. Ah. You know? It's a very sweet scene, but in the in the context of the whole story, it, it doesn't play as interestingly as it could have. Right, yeah. But the idea was compelling that when they were making the next game, they're like, no, 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 no. We can work with this. We got something here. We want to try this more complex, more nuanced take. And I think we can do it next time. And sure as hell, they did, because <laughs> Uncharted 4 is perfect, and I will hear no argument for this. <laughs> I I gotta say, I, as frustrated as I am whenever it's like, oh, the romantic subplot has finally resolved, the characters have gotten together, and then like the sequel's like, just kidding, they've been broken up. It's like, no! But in this case, I, I feel like I actually kind of like what they were going for with it, because yeah. on the one hand, it's like, oh, we can tease out this, well, they won't, they for longer. Um... But in this case, it kind of adds this additional stake because there's no way that Drake and Elena are staying separated because uh, they're like the, the primary slash only compelling romantic subplot in these games. So like, obviously they're gonna get back together. And when Elena shows up again, it's like, hey, we're not just, you know, unpersoning her for the sequel to introduce, uh, <laughs> you know, some other lady. Cause again, like clearly they looked at the Indiana Jones movies and they were like, we're not gonna do that part. We're actually gonna like <laughs> stick with one female lead and make her interesting and, you know, important and stuff. So I think in this case, it kind of serves to make them both feel more emotionally mature. Is like, okay, they got together. It's like they're, 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 they're the right people for each other, but they got together at the wrong time, like a little early, before they'd really worked out all their issues. And um, that that sort of like connection of like, okay, we're married. We need to be like hundo percent like on each other's side and we need to be honest with each other. And Nathan's just like, mm, but, uh, you know, <laughs> like all the time. It's like, come on, man. Um, so having the emotional maturity to be like, look, I still care very deeply about you, but we clearly can't be married because this is not the correct dynamic for us right now. Like it, it's a bummer, but it kind of makes them both feel like more like adults, you know? Uh, and yeah. it's like, yeah, we, we did our romantic subplot. We got married we like each other a lot turns out marriage requires a little bit more than just liking each other a lot and kissing one time on screen um <laughs> and then they go through this game yeah. and you know the idea was there even if the game's execution it sounds like the pacing is what kind of screws it over it's like certain moments needed more setup and uh certain moments need more time to breathe yeah the the pacing is a little bit wonky and it's yeah. not bad it just doesn't work it doesn't for what they're going for yeah it doesn't yeah. hit as hard as they wanted it to it sounds like but by the end it kind of being like nathan drake has gone through character development and is now uh willing to try this again uh and be less bad at it hopefully uh and he is less bad at it in uncharted 4 things are better than they were <laughs> yeah he's still not oh, great yeah. at it but he's he's getting there it's baby steps yeah 
Um, yeah, in, in Uncharted 3, it feels like they, they raised the ambition for what kind of story they wanted to tell, but mm -hmm. the execution did not rise to meet it. In Uncharted 4, they raised the ambition again, and the execution absolutely rose to meet yeah. the bar that they set, which is why it just, it's it's 100% full perfection uh -huh. uh, at every point and I as I said we'll hear no argument yeah. about this I also uh, like and this is just a minor thing but I also like that that makes it very clear that like Elena as a person is like has enough self-respect to be like all right look I like this guy a lot but if the marriage isn't working we're not gonna stay married <laughs> like yeah this it, is not good for me in a lot of romantic subplots where like they smooch and now they are soulmates for life is like that's the be all end all of it it's like a, a switch that gets flipped it's like now we are we move as a unit and we are each the only person any of us care about uh and i like that that's not even true when they're married and it's especially not yeah. true when they're divorced because like elena's like well drake might be dead but i'll go rescue sully i guess like i still like him yeah. <laughs> we'll have brunch um yeah it, it, it's such a fun dynamic what what they have with uh, Elena and Sully because in the in the first game Sully's the one who's like hey we got to cut this reporter loose we can't have her on our tail the whole time and he's <laughs> the one who's like okay let's let's drive this boat out of here and then once Elena catches back up with them Sully's like oh I am never making that mistake again uh, and so Elena and Sully have this very sweet relationship that is just unambiguously caring for each other uh, that's <laughs> where really Sully's fun. like. Madam, <laughs> I will never <laughs> underestimate you so long as I live. Uh, and even when when she's like, "Hey, Drake, you big dumb idiot," it's like, "Sully, good to see you." <laughs> so it is it is very sweet. And and Sully's caring for both of them in in his own way, uniquely between the two of them, is what facilitates their relationship to come back together. Where it's not just you know them deciding to to like each other again or, mm -hmm. or Drake you know trying to be a better person. Um, it is the, the love and care of the people around them that, that helps make them work better, which I also think is a cool message as well. The idea that they're um, like, which of us is going to get my dad in the divorce? It's like, <laughs> we'll, we'll split custody. It's okay. <laughs> I'll take him on weekends. We can get brunch. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. So he's so. just in the other room like, they're so stupid. <laughs> Why do I hang out with these kids? <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, in Uncharted 4, uh, it's the first one to kind of not soft reset their dynamic. It basically just takes the end of Uncharted 3 and, and pulls it forward into the future. Implied five-year time skip with how long it took between uh, the games. They are married, happily living a normal life of not killing or thieving. <laughs> Elena is a journalist and Drake works at a scrapping company doing dives to, you know, pick up wreckage and stuff. The, <laughs> the first sequence, he's kind of like underwater trying to like lift up this this ambiguous truck that's got something in it and then he lifts it up to the surface and it's like, okay, what do we got? And it's just a bunch of copper wire. It's like, ah, we struck copper and Drake is like I'm 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 better than this come on <laughs> <laughs> this is not enough <laughs> I'm still doing something that is nominally what I like but the the vibes are wrong <laughs> it's not compelling I am not I am occupied but not enriched by digging up <laughs> copper from wrecks in the middle of the river in this city from trucks that like fell off the freeway or whatever it's shaped like my old job but it's much less sexy <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And and what I do like about this, even from the start, uh, with the sequence of, of Nate and Elena uh, at their home, it commits to portraying a grounded relationship that is actually a, a true, established, like, in-progress relationship, not just the kind of action movie one kiss hookup like you were talking about earlier, where mm -hmm. it's like, all right, and then we kiss at the end of the movie. Ta-da. It's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> we're, not, we're not just getting them together. They They are together even more so than Uncharted 3. Like, they are a relationship in this game, and we're going to see what that dynamic is like. And I, I like that they committed to that, because there are so few stories where couples actually get to be couples and not just, like, kiss at the end. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that happens here is uh, Drake is like, oh, come on, let me do the dishes. And Elena's like, no, 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 we take turns. And he says, uh, I'll play you for it. <laughs> and then they fire up Elena's uh, favorite game, which is Crash Bandicoot, a very cute little bit of... Uh, of Sony Naughty Dog uh, history there, cheeky, and cheeky. he absolutely fails. Um, it, it's hilarious. Uh, he does not come anywhere close to Elena's uh, high score. Uh, <laughs> so it's like, what the hell in this sequence right here uh, that you, you see in the, the shot where Drake is like, wait, I lost? And she's like, yeah, you got your ass beat, Drake. <laughs> um, it's, it's very sweet. Yeah. They have their whole past life essentially 
crammed up in the attic of their house, which is where this this little section of the story starts where Drake is upstairs. And all of the stuff from the past three games are just in boxes up in the attic, stored away. He's got this little Nerf gun with mm-hmm. plates that are hanging from the ceiling that he shoots. So you can do a little like, oh, you know, Drake is cosplaying himself from five <laughs> years ago. And like, it's sweet that he has this way to still like keep in touch with his old adventuring side, but it's clearly not enough. No. Uh, after dinner, uh, Elena is talking about the story that she's working on about Thailand, and Drake is staring up at a portrait of some vague, you know, jungle beach, and this this kind of, like, dramatic music plays, and eventually Elena's like, hey, Nate, <laughs> were you listening to me? He was like, oh, yeah, no, it was really interesting. She's like, okay, what's my article about? <laughs> what? What is my article about? And you have three options to choose from, and none of them are correct. <laughs> Um, so it's it, it's a very sweet story where they still care about each other so much, but there's clearly something that is absent from their lives mm-hmm. and shoved up in the proverbial attic uh, of their house. And it's a really interesting place to start a story from. Yeah, I think what's really interesting about this is that it is a very natural extension of Nate's uh, arcs from the previous games. Like, they don't need to do any work to convince us that now that he's been out of the adventuring game for five years, he's having a bit of a midlife crisis about it. Like, that's an easy thing to believe. Uh, And I like that it kind of feels like Elena also completely understands what's going on, because, like, she's not like, Nate, were you listening to me? I was really expecting you to be listening to me. It's like, Nate, what was my article about (laughs) if you were listening so intently? (laughs) Like, like again, it, it's this sort of, like, there are so many romantic subplots I've seen in fiction where it's kind of like, she is the most long-suffering f- with the patience of a saint, and she will take any bullshit because they are destined soulmates, and so it's okay that he sucks and is kind of a horrible piece of shit a lot of the time. Yeah. And in this case, it kind of is like, Nate is mostly fine. He's, like, mildly sh- in very, like, understandable ways and elena's response is hmm so your mild shittiness, you want to discuss that or like we're just gonna <laughs> not <laughs> um and it's like she's not yeah. she's not letting it slide she's not like you know just uh, long sufferingly sighing and then being completely fine with it it's like come on man we're equals <laughs> now tell me yeah. what the hell's going on exactly communicate please mm-hmm. and that uh, that ends up actually spilling out into the entire rest of the story whoa thieves and that's, no y- yeah <laughs> uh, and the way you described it I, I i like that a lot um you know it's not just a regular romantic subplot whereas in uncharted even in 1 2 and 3 there're good romantic subplots but uh, less so in Uncharted 3. It, it is kind of the main plot uh, mm. in a very important way, even if it doesn't work as, as well as it should. But right. in Uncharted 1 and 2, the romance is a really good romantic subplot, but is still kind of fundamentally a subplot. Whereas in Uncharted 4, it is a love story. Yeah. And that's the story that everything else is built on. <laughs> and I, I really like that they're they're willing to commit to, to that um, for, for this vision uh, in this game. But of course it can't be all domestic bliss forever or we wouldn't have a video game. So uh, Nate's long lost brother, Sam <laughs> arrives to kickstart the plot, uh, having been broken out of jail by Hector Alcazar, uh, that old guy. Hmm. Um, he's like, hey, I'm in debt to this guy, the old you know, Alcazar thing. Um, I need to find the lost pirate treasure of Henry Avery that we were looking into when we were kids. Um, there's kind of like a various flashbacks earlier in the game when they were searching for yep. um, this treasure in Panama in a prison, and you know they have this whole breakout sequence, and Drake escapes, and Sam doesn't. Um, he gets shot, and Drake thinks he's dead, so he buries that part of his life, which is why he didn't exist in games one, two, and three. <coughs> uh, so it, it, it's a very good way to justify that within the world, where it's like, ah, they clearly didn't have the idea for this character yet. But given the way that he <laughs> dies uh, in the beginning of Uncharted 4, I understand why. Yeah. Drake's traumatized. I get why he wouldn't share that. Um, so uh, Sam shows up. He's like, hey, we can find this thing. We kind of need to because uh, I'm in big mode debt to Hector Alcazar. And they go searching through Italy, Scotland, and Madagascar for this pirate treasure and uh, what turns out to be the uh, the lost pirate utopia of Libertalia somewhere in the Indian Ocean. Hmm. This, this whole first half of the game culminates in a pretty thrilling motorcycle chase sequence and the revelation of precisely where Avery's 
pirate utopia is hidden just off the coast of Madagascar. And it's this really dramatic sequence, because the first, like, fifth of the game has no gunplay whatsoever. It only really explodes onto the scene in the first section in Italy. Mm. So there's this very slow build, and the most dramatic thing that happens up to this point is this Madagascar sequence where there's this huge climb, this tower explodes, there's this big chase through the city. The brothers Drake are on this motorcycle being chased by this huge ATV and they're shooting it and it explodes. It's like, wow, this huge bombastic thing that is not spectacularly more dramatic than what we've seen in other games. And, you know, there's a lot of things the other games did that were much more set PC and big, but this one with such a slow ramp up is the the highest intensity and like the biggest adrenaline rush of the game so far. Mm -hmm. And then with this extra revelation of, oh my God, we found where the treasure is, let's go get it. This comes crashing into Elena's waiting for them at their hotel, and she says, how's the Malaysia job going, Nate? Seems like you're a hair off course, wop, because wop. Nate had lied to Elena about going on this job to cover for the fact that he had to run away and do the plot for a few weeks. And, uh, yeah, this scene's, this, this is rough, uh, for yeah. Drake, uh, and Elena, uh, and Sully. It's just... No fun. And Drake not thinking that his wife, the investigator, would investigate and find out what's happening uh, really reflects poorly uh, <laughs> on him. Yeah. And he tries to play the protagonist's defense of, oh, well, I, I had to protect you. And she says, you just didn't have the nerve to face me again. That's bullshit. You know it. You <laughs> lied to me for weeks. If you were killed, I wouldn't have even known about it. Yep. And Drake is like, oh, well, you see, I, I knew you would react like this. And she's like... What do you mean <laughs> you knew I would react like this? <laughs> How would you react? Um, it's it's a very emotional scene where Elena is justifiably pissed. Mm -hmm. And one of the things she says is, was there even a Malaysia job? Which is like seemingly the smallest detail in all of this. But since Drake had in fact been told by his boss that there was this job in Malaysia that they could do, Elena's like, was literally any of this ever true mm. like scraping down the strata to find out how deep the lies go and working back up from there it's a very small detail in the scene but the fact that like that's the anchor point she tries to go to is telling where she's like i have to evaluate every single thing i've ever heard <laughs> in my yeah. life and it is very compelling very well done very well acted too same level as like um in nelson versus murdoch one of the best episodes of daredevil when Fog yeah. is like are you even really blind <laughs> it's are you like even really blind like when, when yeah. you when you've lied to your loved one about you know something that you think is justifiable from their perspective it's still a profound betrayal and now they have to question yeah. absolutely everything i do i think this is a fun little curveball because you're, you're right, the game is absolutely, like, setting up a very standard momentum. It's like, oh, now we're yep. back in it. Like, the start of the game, it was kind of slow and weird and domestic, but now we're, like, back in it. This is the way an Uncharted game should be. And then it's like, hey, jackass, remember, this isn't just a vehicle for you, the player, to have a good time. Nathan Drake is mm -hmm. a character with three and a half games of character development behind him, and his baggage has come with him. <laughs> so, yeah. and I love the, the point you had about, like, Nathan not considering, like, oh, yeah, my wife, the investigative journalist, my figure out that something's hinky about what I'm doing. Um, yeah. But uh, and from like a player perspective, it's easy to lose track of that too because you get so caught up in like the Nathan Drake Adventure Hour and then yep. it's like, hey, dumbass, remember how this keeps happening? <laughs> well, it's happening again. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And and Drake tries to, to deflect and be like, oh, well, I, I have to do this to save my brother who I never told you about. <laughs> um, and he says, look, I don't even care about the treasure. I just need to save my brother. And she says, the look on your face when you walked into this room, you can stop lying to me, but you need to stop lying to yourself. And mm -hmm. then she leaves. Uh, and it's it's the last little bit of like him saying, oh, well, I don't even care about it. And Elena's like, bull. <laughs> yeah. One interesting thing is that, like, it does take Nathan Drake, you know, uh, some hours of gameplay before he's really in the swing of things, too, because, like, his brother does keep being like, hey, man, we just need to get the treasure. It's, just, uh, you know, all the Uncharted games do this, where it's like, it's going to be here. And it's like, it's not here, but a journal that leads to where it actually is is yeah. here. It's like, it's not there either, but a journal that leads to the... And uh, so Nathan Drake is getting Nathan Draked, but, like, every time there's another twist, he gets, like, more into it. He doesn't get mad. He's not like, I thought the treasure yeah. was going to be here. He's like, ooh, Liberty 
Italia, hell yeah. Yeah. Um, Cause he like, this is enrichment for him. He's so excited at the prospect, but the whole time he's like, no, I'm just doing this to save my brother. I'm not, it's, come on. I'm. Just, uh, it's bad enough that I've already lied to my wife once, but like, I can't be having fun too. But like, he gets so caught up in it. Cause this is legitimately yeah. like such a source of joy for him. But it's not in a healthy way is the thing that's yeah. interesting. Like, like it establishes at the beginning of the game, like Nathan Drake's current happy ending is actually unsustainable because it's it's happy on the surface. It, it's shaped like a happy ending, but it's not right for Nathan Drake, certified weirdo who really does enjoy climbing up big buildings and, <laughs> uh, you know, exploring jungle caves and stuff like that. It seems like the writers were kind of like, is that a happy ending for Nathan Drake? I feel like Nathan Drake doesn't know what his own happy ending is shaped like. So at the beginning of the game, he's not willing to tell Elena, like, hey, I'm not feeling great. I, I feel like, you know, I, I'm like bored and understimulated and my diving job is making me feel worse about not being able to go on cool adventures. He can't acknowledge that to himself, even though he's clearly feeling it. He certainly can't acknowledge it to Elena. So instead, he's like, I'll just go behind her back and do one more adventure, and then I'll be fine. Then the happy ending will work for me. Because yeah. he's wrong about himself and his own internal character arc. He hasn't processed, like, because of who I am as a person, my ideal life is not going to be shaped like what we currently have. And he doesn't know how to tell that to the person who is his happy ending. And I, I think that's a really interesting conflict because it's coming from a place of love. He doesn't want to look, you know, his wife in the eye and say, hey, this life we built for ourselves doesn't make me happy. Like, that, what a gut wrench that would be. Like, it's clear that yeah. the last time they got divor divorced, it wasn't like his idea, he, you know? Um, yeah. So he probably doesn't want to relitigate that. Uh, certainly doesn't want to reopen that wound. And then it's like, hey, here's the perfect solution to this. You can go on one last adventure that'll definitely fix everything and scratch the itch and you'll never want to do this again. And then you can go back to your nice domestic uh, white picket fence life and be fine and never, and never be Nathan Drake again. That's, yeah. And he's like, that's good. This is what it's going to be. And Elena's like, that's never going to happen, you dingus. I just need you to be honest yeah. with me and yourself. Um, exactly. Yeah. And he, he almost says what he means when he says, I don't even care about the treasure, which he thinks he's saying, I don't even care about the money. Which is correct. Which is true. Yeah. He doesn't care about the money, but he does care about the treasure because that's the enrichment, the, the hunt, the chase, the investigation, the history. That's mm -hmm. what he's all about. E even a little bit of the danger. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so it's it's a it's a rough scene and mm. it's it's so well done because it comes on the heels of Drake and the player being the most like jazzed up about the adventure with this huge dramatic set piece that just comes crashing to a halt with this scene where it's like, oh no, the consequences of my actions personified <laughs> in the arrival of the one character I didn't think would arrive. Ah, surely yeah. these cons is won't quince. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> it's love not that mine. Uh, uh, it's, it's still good, though. Yeah. So, uh, notably, uh, Sam Drake keeps quiet this whole time. When Elena leaves, Sully is like, Drake, you dumb f go after her. And he, he says, no, Sully, we're not done here. I got to find this treasure for Sam. Mm. And Sully says, I mean, we can do a lot of other things. We can put him in hiding, give him a new identity. And Drake says, he's been in prison for 15 years. We're not going to put him in hiding. We got to do this, you know. And he kind of like brushes away other possible options. And then Sully says, well, at least let me go with Sam and then you go, you know, be with your wife. And uh, Nate, in a moment of, of frustration, snaps and says, if you want to be useful, Sullivan, you go after her. Woo. Just like, oh, Nathan. <laughs> <laughs> and all that time, Sam doesn't say a word until Sully leaves. And then Sam says, anything I can... Um... <laughs> help you with uh and drake is like shut up because uh, he, he's mad at him but doesn't want to direct that frustration at sam because i'm trying to save sam mm -hmm. uh but of course this is all actually sam's fault uh, he's been lying to nathan this entire time and this becomes apparent after they carry on make it to libertalia get caught by the bad guys uh led by rafe the the third guy and their their old investigating bunch who escaped from prison with um uh, with nate and sam and is leading the uh evil mercenary guys and uh, it is revealed that uh, the Hector Alcazar gambit uh, was never true. He had died in a shootout uh, six months ago, and Sam was actually broken out by Rafe. Mm. And the entire modus operandi for him and Drake going to find the treasure to pay off a debt was not true. Sam had lied to Nate, and then he turned around and lied to Elena. And then after that something-something gunfight, Sam gets shot, and Nate falls off a cliff, and he 
stumbles into this this river, falls down, mm -hmm. clink, clank, smack on the head, and is found by Elena. Yeah. Who radios up to Sully like, hey, we got him. Uh, and Sully and Elena independently found Libertalia. Because <laughs> they're good at this sh Yep, yep. And then we get a flashback to a sequence uh, with Nate and Sam as kids, where they are breaking into this old lady's house to find all of the stuff from their late mother. And the, the whole sequence there is they're finding her notes on Henry Avery's treasure, and they essentially decide to, like, you know, live up to her legacy and become the heirs of Francis Drake, which, mm -hmm. according to history, Francis Drake had no heirs, but their mom, Cassandra Morgan, was like, oh, he did have heirs, we just don't know about them historically, so they're like, will be Francis Drake's heirs, and then they want to go find this treasure to, like, fulfill their family legacy. So it's this very dramatic moment of, like, their whole familial identity as the Brothers Drake is, is forged in the hunt for this treasure, which is why it's so important to Nate, but also really important to Sam, because this is his whole life. He didn't have any of this other stuff. He didn't have an Elena. He didn't have Uncharted's 1, 2, and 3. Right. So we get a little bit of context about why this matters so much. So I want to take an interlude with what the treasure actually means yeah. in this story. In El Dorado, uh, in Uncharted 1, it is gold that poisons you. Uh, Shambhala, Uncharted 2, the treasure is immortality resin that poisons you. Uh, Iram of the Pillars, the city of uh, Ubar, the treasure is a magic city full of uh, magic water that poisons you. <laughs> there is a theme afoot. <laughs> they can never really get the treasure because the treasure is not something you want. It just kills you and looks shiny while doing it. Wow, literally, this is not a place of honor. <laughs> This is not a place of honor. Exactly. Every you you time. were spot on it. Yep. It's never a place of honor. That feel when you think it's a place of honor and then it's actually not a place of honor. In Libertalia, the treasure is a secret pirate utopia that pries on your darkest impulses with the sheer temptation of its existence and poisons your mind into a backstabbing monster with nothing but the purest essence of mundane, simple greed. It doesn't actually poison you. It's not magic. It's just greed. Wow. The treasure is just greed. The real so. poison was inside <laughs> us all along. <laughs> it's the insidious kind of poison. You're poisoning yourself and you don't even know it. The poison is your character themes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, basically. And this ties into the broader themes that are at work with uh, Uncharted 4 and the, the thematic wrapping around Libertalia and all this stuff that, that leads up to it. The, the beginning of the treasure hunt starts with a cross for St. Dismas, who is the penitent thief of the two people who were crucified alongside Jesus. There's the dickhead thief and the penitent thief, St. <laughs> Dismas. Goofus and Gallant over here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and th this treasure is, is essentially predicated on this idea of like, ah, these pirates are creating a utopia. They're the penitent thieves. They're the ones who like, ah, yes, we do our thieving, but it's, it's for a greater good or we have ideals and stuff. And there's all this, this symbolism and kind of grandiosity wrapped around this, this breadcrumb trail that, that Henry Avery leads to this, this treasure. It's like, ah, oh, you know, Libertalia, magical utopia, not really magic, but it's a utopia, fantastic. And this St. Dismas figure is one that Avery is seeking to emulate and that Drake is seeking to emulate. And there's a lot of parallels that are kind of drawn between them. But Libertalia is a pure simple lie, because once we actually get to Libertalia, we see that it is the distilled essence of thievery and betrayal. Everything on the inside is a grand, disgusting parasite of theft and betrayal. Mm. There are a dozen founder pirates that created the colony and then brought in hundreds or thousands of other ones. They had this huge treasury that's bigger and grander than even the Bank of England would be a hundred years later. But all of these pirates live in a secret second city called New Devon, away from the common pirates of Libertalia. Ah. And it is revealed that they stole everything out of the treasury for themselves. And then when the regular pirates found out about this, they staged a revolt to go storm the treasury and like get what was theirs. And they realized, oh wait, there's nothing here. Um, so they go and try to attack New Devon and the revolt is brutally, gruesomely suppressed. And then after it's just those 12 founder pirates left, they start turning against each other. When you actually get to New Devon, you see that it's flooded and there are a bunch of cannons on everyone's, like these giant mansions have cannons on their front lawns <laughs> pointing out at each other. It's, uh. it's kind of comical, but it's like, yeah, as soon as there were only 12 of them left, they turned on each other because even then split, you know, a thousand ways with all the pirates of Libertalia. Oh, well, that's too small. And then split a dozen ways. 
well, there's only so many people I have to pick off before it's only split one way. Mm-hmm. And you see how this 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 pries at you until eventually there's no one left. Once a thief, always a thief. There was no grand ideological dressing in Libertalia. Whether or not it started that way, uh, maybe they had a grand idea and a noble cause at one point, but it was ultimately all just a facade for thievery. It was the greatest con any pirate ever pulled. <laughs> yeah, but also like... I think that this is a very interesting um, thematic concept to have play nice with uh, Nathan Drake's failure to have a happy ending at the start Mm -hmm. of the game where he, like, because at the beginning he's like, "Uh, I'm not really doing any thieving anymore. And, like, you know, he doesn't miss robbing people, but he definitely misses the adventure. And then he sees this where it's like, wow, the thief's happy ending, the the magical thief city of Libertalia. (laughs) And then it's like, "Mm, sure, it's very corpsey in here. (laughs) Doesn't really seem like they had a good time for very long. And then he's kind of basically confronted with, like, the apotheosis of everything wrong with with this thing that he's been pursuing. Because, like, this is coming right on the heels of literally this in miniature when it turns out Sam Mm -hmm. was lying to him. And then it turns out Rafe was lying to both of them. and, And it turns out this whole thing was then manipulating him because Nathan Drake like he's he's probably like the most noble and honest thief character in these games and that he's like he's doing it for the love of it and he's only robbing people who've been dead for a really long time or rich people who deserve it you know that kind of thing like yeah. it's, it's getting framed as like well he's Nathan Drake he's like a, we like him he's fun he's fun yeah and then all that means is that like that he's just going to get taken advantage of by all the nasty thieves that are actually willing to, like, uh, you know, just rob from anybody or or take advantage of, of that kindness. Because, like, you look at Libertalian, it's like, not all these thieves would have been bad guys, but most of them just got brutally slaughtered. So, like, it doesn't matter that, that yeah. they maybe were decent or, <laughs> like, actually believed in, like, the, the sort of communist utopia Libertalia vision. Like, it, it doesn't... Yeah, Sully calls them commie pirates. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter if even most of them were like, yeah, we're gonna... This is gonna be our, like, this is gonna be great. Because they just got murdered by the ones that were trying to take all the stuff for themselves. And Nathan Drake has literally just played out this betrayal in miniature and gotten shot for his troubles about it. So, like, it kind of makes sense that he's now seen both sides of the, uh, well, uh, normal happy ending didn't work for me. But also pirate happy ending's not looking so good either, so, uh... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, we don't see, uh, Drake engaging in, uh, thievery and betrayal in quite the same way, but he is lying... And he is a victim of obsession, mm. um, and that's the word that that most accurately fits him. Where he's not, uh, he's not evil. He's not a, a betrayer. He's not uh, uh, quite those awful things that are said about some of the other pirates. But he is obsessed, yeah, viciously obsessed with finding this. Not for the money, just for the sake of finding it. <laughs> I'd say the the main problem with Nathan Drake is that he is loyal to a fault. It makes him extremely manipulable. Like, in the case of Elena, it's like, I will uh, lie to Elena and leave her behind solely for the purposes of keeping her safe and well out of the action. Uh, yeah. Because from his perspective, that is like that's the finest, you know, that's the that's the greatest act of love he could do. Is like, I want to keep her safe and out of it because she doesn't enjoy this. Like, this isn't for her. This is this is a me thing, but this is also for my brother. And I think part of what made that that scene where they had the fight so brutal is like, on the one hand, Nate is doing this for the wrong reasons, but on the other hand, there is a very real part of him that's doing this for the right reasons. He thinks this is the only way to really save his brother. Yeah. You know, obviously as a side effect it also means he gets to go on this fun adventure but when it's like put him in witness protection it's like he's been in prison for 15 years witness protection is going to be more prison we're not going to put him in more prison <laughs> like that all makes sense and the problem with with Nathan Drake is that he is he's much too loyal and he's much too like focused and so he'll be like this is the one way to do this and this is the one way I can do this that keeps everybody safe it leads him down self-destructive paths and it makes him extremely manipulable like happened in the first half of the game with Sam yeah and now in the back half where like oh you know all the lies are out in the open and all the secrets have been revealed he's still hunting for the treasure uh now with Elena and Sully and it's almost out of obligation at this point like like this is the re- this is the last remnant of it because he no longer has the noble reason to be looking for it now it's just like curiosity and and making sure that Rafe doesn't get it first. Yeah, so the the back half after this the, this convenient midpoint uh, <laughs> in the in the Libertalia section of the game, the story changes now. It's not Drake and Sam going, or it's not Nate and Sam going through Libertalia. It's Nate and Elena, and the through line of of this this last section of the game is Nate's slow climb back up to being a good husband. Yeah. <laughs> slow, gratuitous, gradual 
climb up where he has to to make good over the the span of several different scenes uh, going through this. He's uh, chasing after Sam to try and save him. Um, Sully is kind of like you know up in the air with with the plane uh, ready to you know try to help them out, but he's he's not on the ground in that in that specific moment for the for these sequences. It's, it's just Nate and Elena. Right. What happens after they kind of like get back up and start moving is uh, Elena radios up to Sully, and then Nate explains what happened, and he's like, "Yeah, turns out uh, Sam was lying about everything. What an asshole, right?" And he looks at Elena. When he says, what an asshole, which is like, <laughs> I'm talking to Sully, but you know that I'm talking about me too. I'm sorry. Uh, and it's like the first of, of many little moments working uh, back up. So Nate says, you know, thank you for saving me again. And Elena looks him dead in the soul and says, this time I almost didn't. Woo! And then they they continue on. Uh, they you know, do some puzzle platforming, yada, yada, yada. It's an Uncharted game. Yeah, uh, they're in this pirate elevator going up uh, with their Jeep to drive towards New Devon, seeing the beautiful view outward. And the shot composition is amazing because this beautiful view just uh, juxtaposed with um, this this dark framing of the actual inside of, of the elevator lift. And Elena has her wedding ring hand comfortably, you know, <laughs> leaning on this pillar, and Drake is so uncomfortably hunched, yeah. <laughs> trying to find a way to talk to her. And he says, you know, hey, you you mentioned that you almost didn't come back. Why'd you change your mind? And she says, oh, well, you know, I knew you were in over your head, but also there's that whole marriage vow thing. <laughs> and Drake is like, you know, for better or worse. And she says, for better or worse. So there's this recognition that Aww. he's an idiot, but he's my idiot. Uh, and that is... <laughs> Very much the character of, of, of what is happening from Elena's point of view yeah. uh, in this this last little section. That's really so. sweet because I feel like that's actually like a big relief for Drake specifically because like the last time their relationship didn't go hot, they were divorced for an entire game. And you know in his yeah. head he's like, I'm so stupid. What if we're divorced again? And then she's just like, yeah. no, you idiot. We're married for keeps this time. <laughs> I knew I was signing yeah. up for this kind of thing when I married you because it had happened three times already. <laughs> yeah. You can't get rid of me that easily. Yeah. There's a sequence where um, as they're platforming towards this elevator, Elena makes a jump over a, a waterfall. And Nate says, nice jump. And she's like, oh, yeah, thanks. And Drake says, way to piss a girl like that off, idiot. Uh, he <laughs> mutters to himself under his breath, like, god damn it, I'm so stupid. Ah! I do really like how throughout most of these games, Nate is just absolutely smitten with Elena. Like, it, yeah. like we know, we can infer why Elena likes Nathan. Like, there's a few reasons. You know, he's charismatic. He's fun. Uh, he's pretty reliable 90% of the time. But, like, we know exactly why Nathan is in love with Elena. And it's it's a very sweet way to frame this because, um, again, not to like unfavorably compare every other primary romantic subplot ever written, but I think that in a lot of cases it's like, whoa, pretty girl, a wooga. And then it just kind of goes from there because it's like, <laughs> I am main male lead and you are main female lead and we must therefore do the smooching. And it's like, all right, cool. But in this case, it's like, no, there's like a million reasons for Nate to be in love with Elena. And every yeah. time he f***ed it up, he's like, God, I'm so stupid. <laughs> just really funny. <laughs> It's like, I don't even know if I love her more for being a genius or a badass or both. <laughs> ah, God, there's so many reasons. Every time she catches me in a lie and tracks me across literally the entire world, I just remember why I love her more. <laughs> yeah. So you see Drake um, just serially trying to say something mm -hmm. and getting tripped up on his words. So when they're when they're about to get out of the elevator, they're talking and she says, you know, you, you can't just cut me out like that. We're a team. That's what this whole marriage thing is. For better or worse and they you know, keep going on they get in the jeep and drive and it's a really beautiful sequence where as they're driving towards new devon there's just silence they're just not talking they're driving there's no threats there's no danger mm -hmm. and this this track uh, for better or worse which if i do my editing right will be playing under this portion of the the detailed diatribe is, hey. is playing uh and it's just it's a really sweet moment of just this this companionate loving comfortable silence between the two of them after after that conversation drake is is trying to say the words but he doesn't entirely know what they are but he's really trying and elena keeps being like hey come on 
we, we got to keep moving. Let's 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 keep going. We we got places to be. Like I, I know you're trying, but like we we got to save your brother. <laughs> um, so she's trying to stay on track. And even that is it's not just like you know Elaine is perfect and and Drake is uh, a, a big dumb idiot. Yeah. Uh, you know it, it seems that way on 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 first viewing. But well, we're seeing this from Drake's perspective, and you know yeah. that's how he feels about this whole thing. Yes. It's like oh, Elaine has never done anything wrong in her life, and I'm so stupid. And what if she doesn't like me anymore? And meanwhile, from Elena's perspective, she's like, all right, maybe flying halfway around the world on a hunch, you know, in the middle of my work week, maybe this was a little <laughs> bit much. <laughs> the Elena version of this game is a very different experience. Very different experience. She keeps sending the conversation off and like, hey, we got to focus because she's even a little uncomfortable with with, with seeing Drake be like this. Mm -hmm. um, and it really comes to a head in, in the next sequence where they work their way through New Devon. Um, they they find the city. It's all, you know, ruined and all these mansions of cannons pointing at each other. And they kind of figure out, uh, they reverse engineer what happened, what order of operations. And Elena's like mentioning, oh, it could have been this. And they broke that dam and that flooded in here. And Drake says, you know, you're pretty good at this. And she's like, yeah, you're pretty good at this yourself. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I forgot how smart she is. God. Um, <laughs> I'm so they stupid. They eventually make it to, yeah, so stupid. <laughs> ah! uh, they make it to Thomas II's house, who is the, the other main pirate captain, along with Henry Avery, where they find at this big, gorgeous banquet table, the bodies of the 10 other founders who were poisoned um, Poison. at a peace parlay by Avery and two. And this scene is just really, really gorgeous. I love the way it's composed, uh, yeah, where they, they pick up the little placards that have all the pirate sigils. And it's like, oh, hey, like this is one of the founders. Wait, all of these are founders. And then Elena picks up a note that says like, uh, hello, friends, the, the time has come to abandon our animosities and point our souls back towards God. So please come join me and Henry Avery at my house and we'll parlay and it'll all be great. Uh -huh. And then all the pirates are dead. So <laughs> Elena's like, like pirate suicide cult. And Drake says, no, not these guys. But what do you want to bet? And then they go to the front of the table and there's the two placards for Thomas Toon and Henry Avery. And those mm -hmm. are the two who aren't there. Na 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 na. So they they kind of reverse engineer what's happening, and Elena kind of like takes a a step back as Drake like out loud vocalizes and and puts together the order of operations that okay so they they quash the rebellion and then once it's twelve of them they turn on each other and they're fighting and then Henry Avery and two think okay well we can this is getting out of hand let's invite them poison them kill them and then suddenly all the treasure in Libertalia belongs to two men and all these other pirates in an instant are dead and he's like having this big moment of like discovering the history and putting the pieces together and saying like history's greatest pirates died all at once at this very table and he's just in awe of this and mm -hmm. elena who in the shot here is like gorgeous shot composition is just looking at him with this this loving look that i can't even describe where it's yeah. like god you're you're so beautiful and amazing, but you're so stupid. Um, she, all she can say is it's incredible. And it's it, it's on two levels because of course she's saying that the, the story and the narrative is incredible, but she is also in awe of how much passion Drake has for, for this history and this moment that he's he's put together and he's figured out what happened to the pirate captains of Libertalia. Mm -hmm. So it's this it's this kind of like double uh double meaning line. And Drake hearing Elena gets flustered, he's like, Oh, I mean, yeah, it's um no, I'm sorry. It's just it takes a second, and he 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 looks at her. He hasn't been looking at her. He's been looking at the table and the mm -hmm. pirates this whole time. And he looks at her and he says, "I'm sorry." And he he really feels it. He, he you can hear in the delivery. Nolan North absolutely nails it. He really sells how just all at once sad he feels, mm -hmm. realizing like I love this so much. This life, this discovery, the the learning, the adventure. Oh God, but at what cost? And yeah. again, they play uh, for better or worse um, underneath the sequence. And it only starts when Nate gets caught, flustered, takes a breath before he says, I'm sorry. And then Elena looks at him and says, it's okay. And then again, she kind of changed the conversation. Like, come on, we, we got to get going. Mm -hmm. It's it's a very, very well done sequence. Yeah. And what I like about it is that it makes it clear that like, well, from, from Nathan's perspective, this whole game is like, oh man, you know, my wife wouldn't approve. She can't know that I'm going to do this one last pirate thing. And meanwhile, Elena is like looking at him with just absolute wonder in her eyes as she's seeing him in absolute peak Nathan Drake mode. Yeah. She's like, this is like, like she's been along for the last three adventures. Obviously, this is the man she fell in love with. And the fact that like yeah. now he's like, no, I, I've left that stuff behind for her. And she's like 
So so he's apologizing because again it's like this is what he loves, but at what cost? And she's mm-hmm. like, it's okay. No, like really, like obviously the the lying to me and getting shot at by nasty men with guns that part's not good. But like this part, this part's good. This part's fine. <laughs> you know, yeah. if you can't bond over a table full of ten dead legendary pirates, is your marriage even working? <laughs> 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 exactly. <laughs> it's it's such a great scene. It's probably my favorite one in the whole game because so much stuff uh, comes together. But of mm-hmm. course, uh, Elena once again kind of shifts the focus away. She she's not quite ready to to forgive him entirely yet, even though she recognizes in this moment like that's that's the man I married. That's mm-hmm. my husband. I love him so much. There's still it's it, they're not quite there yet, and it's really compelling that they they took the time uh, the writers took the time over several scenes to like work them up slowly towards this reconciliation Mm -hmm. scene by scene with with elena finding drake him just telling everything like no more lies here's the whole story here's my backstory my name was not actually drake it used to be morgan we changed it um (laughs) the cooler very formative (laughs) yeah uh like yeah morgan (laughs) is also a pirate but you know (laughs) yeah it's the lame one, corporate, yeah. That, for better or worse scene, there's another one that I did mention earlier where um, Drake admits that he was just scared um, of, of losing her, which is why he had cut her out. Mm-hmm. And this sequence here, and then the next one, uh, they make it to Avery's house and go under his catacombs, which are full of very thematically appropriate skeleton parts. So there's a <laughs> bunch of skeleton arms labeled the hands that stole from me. Jeez. There are a bunch of, uh, this is under Henry Avery's house, so this is probably like during and after the the pirate revolt uh there's a bunch of rib cages the hearts that hardened against me and then there are a bunch of jaws the mouths that spoke ill of me avery's fucking nuts uh culminating in full-on mummy bombs uh they call them where it's just these corpses of people that are rigged with explosives (laughs) underneath these catacombs rough uh no fun so avery's nuts uh not the pirate you really want to emulate for all the the dressing up and the saint dismas uh imagery from earlier saint dismas famous for his murders and love of explosives (laughs) famous for turning his victims into more explosives oh man and then you explode two friends and they explode two friends (laughs) into pyramid scheme wow um so after a close call, uh, getting out of a particularly nasty scrape in these catacombs, uh, one of Avery's traps, Nate, like, ah, oh, just like old times, right? And Elena is silent. And the camera pans over and she's not moving. It's like, hey, Elena, wake up, wake up. And she kind of mutters, my hero. And then starts laughing and Drake is like, oh my God, how? No, you can't do that. You nearly gave me a heart attack. And she's like, oh, what's that like? I bet that sucks, doesn't it, you big dumb idiot? Uh, so she, oh. she lies on his chest and is like, oh no, it sounds like it's working fine to me. <laughs> and Nate says, you realize that we are now square for everything, right? And Elena looks at him like, no, absolutely not. No, 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 no. You, we got a, you got a lot to make up for, buddy. But this culminates the husband apology tour where after the last scene where he admits, you know, I'm sorry. And then they kind of have the reconciliation of like, this is what we, we missed. This is what we were longing for. Mm-hmm. The sense of adventure and discovery. There's this moment where Elena is like, okay, you apologized but I get to get back at you a little bit. <laughs> that was also in the and vows. Then, if you f*** with me too much, I'll play dead for like three seconds just to just to screw yeah. with you a little bit. So Nate gets the tiniest dose, but meaningful, uh, of the pain that he caused Elena. So now they are not quite even, but they are on a balanced footing. And this is the only conversation where finally they, they have a kiss and then they say, good talk, mutually like, good talk, yeah, good talk. Um, or they don't, you know, uh, change the topic uh, again. Elena is not like, okay, come on, we got to keep going. It's like, okay, with that, all these scenes leading up to this, we're okay. That's beautiful. Uh, it, it's a very sweet uh, way to bring that sequence full circle. I mean, it's also really funny because again, we're basically in Nathan's head for most of the game. So like, yeah. so we have to sort of infer what Elena is going through. And like at the start, she's definitely like, like livid, like I can't even deal with this man. And then slowly she's like, all right, he's, he's really does seem to be like, and then like at the end, it's like, all right, do I forgive him? Or do I f- with him just a little bit first? It's like, well, there's no shot. I mean, obviously, like, when am I going to have this good of a chance again? <laughs> As a treat, yeah. just for me. She like, yeah. like the bomb goes off and she's like, okay, I'm all good. I'm not injured. But you know what would be hilarious? <laughs> <laughs> like the, yeah. the split second yeah. decision. Yeah, and and that's what I, when I was putting together these slides, I didn't really recognize the importance of this scene in particular. I thought it was funny, but I didn't realize like, no, no, no. <laughs> it's important that, that Elena gets this moment to be like, all right, <laughs> come on. So that's why this is 
where they say mm -hmm. good talk and they finally are like, okay, we brought it all together. Yeah. And Nate says, anyone ever tell you have a funny idea of romantic, which is hey. a callback to what Sully says in the first game. Yeah. Um, also, it's, I think it's very sweet. You know, like we've been discussing how these two, like they're very much equals in their relationship, but that doesn't mean that they have identical skill sets and it doesn't mean they're like mm -hmm. two versions of the same character. And I like the little highlighting moments of like, this is a thing that Elena would do for a gag. This is not a stunt Nate would ever pull on Elena. No. <laughs> Under no circumstances. And it's, it's always a fun little moment of characterization to see a character do something that none of the other characters would do. Cause you're like, wow, that's really yeah. you. And especially Especially in the case of Elena, <laughs> who is a little bit slotted into, like, she is a very, very much her own character, but she is a little bit slotted into a very stock role in a lot of these games of, like, she's never, like, the princess in the castle, but she is often, like, backstory girlfriend. She's the token, uh, you know, conventionally attractive blonde li lady, love interest, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then it's like, she's the only person in this entire game who would literally pretend to be horribly dead from a pirate bomb just to fuck <laughs> with her husband a little bit. Like, that that's a level of not quite hinged that I think you don't automatically get with this character archetype when, yeah. you, when you buy a six-pack of them at Costco, you know? <laughs> they don't all come with that feature. It's an Elena specialty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. They they are very clearly not the same person, but they are made for each other. It's beautiful. <laughs> they are a perfect pair. Yeah. So after this, um, the gang reunites, uh, they link up with Sam and Sully, and we not only see like, okay, like they've they've made up, they're they're back on the same footing. They are, you know, together again, meaningfully, they understand each other much more deeply now. But we have to get the demonstration that Nate has actually learned his lesson. And again, mm -hmm. I didn't put this together until I was watching it this morning <laughs> when I was finishing up my slides, where Sam is the only one who still wants to pursue the treasure, even though Nate, Sully, and Elena are like, we're good. Yeah. We're done. All four <laughs> of us are here. We're all safe. Let's leave. Sam realizes that he can't convince Elena and Sully, so he goes over to Nate and just talks to him like... Mm -hmm look, this is, this is our thing. Like, this is what we as brothers are going to do. Like, no offense to the other guys, but they don't get it. Mm -hmm. And Nate says, no, Sam, they, they do. <laughs> Believe me, they do. Um, so Nate not only refuses its acknowledgement that he's changed, uh, he's not going to do that again. This interaction right here is a remix, essentially, of the whole plot, where Sam is like, come on, let's go, you and me. Mm -hmm. And Nate says, that's... It's not just you and me. There's more people we have to think about. It's not just us two brothers, little, you know, uh, teenagers against the world anymore. There are people who care about us that we have to care about. So it's a very, very nice moment where, um, you know, Sam kind of moves on ahead afterwards and Elena comes up behind Drake and pats him on the shoulder like, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for not f***ing up twice in the same way. <laughs> exactly. They're making their way out of the city and then by a happenstance of the level geometry um, Sam ends up on the other side of a collapsed platform from the rest of the gang and then he like looks back towards the mountain and Nate is like don't you do it and <laughs> Sam is like I'm sorry I have to yeah. and Nate says if you go I'm not coming after you and then Sam just runs off and they're like okay well we gotta go find another route to go back after him and then Nate um, Sully and Elena are pushing a cart to get over a wall but the cart gets loose mm -hmm. and then Elena's like just go so Nate gets up and jumps over the wall the cart goes back down Sully is like you know okay kid go and Elena says it's not fair doing the dishes we take turns, don't even think about not coming back. Aww. And this is the moment of Nate's growth because he looks at Elena, he like nods and says, I love you, and leaves. And then Elena says, good luck, cowboy, which is a reference to in the nah. first game. Uh, after Drake ditches her with the boat, um, she finds him. Uh, says, whoa there, cowboy, where do you think you're going? And punches him in the face. Yeah! Like, don't you run away from me. <laughs> so it's a very, very cool moment bringing that together from Uncharted 1. But it's also, it represents Nate's growth because he is, on one level, he's doing the same thing he did before. He's running off to save his brother, leaving Sully and Elena behind. Mm -hmm. But he's doing it for the right reasons, and he is communicating it to his wife. Uh -huh, so this uh -huh. is the demonstration that Nate has changed and doing things the right way now. It's not just, oh, don't go save your brother. It's go save your brother, but there's a right way to do it, and this is what it is. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, also, just from the way you described it, it sounds like Nate can only get over to, you know, how where he can save Sam with the help of Elena and Sully. <laughs> 
else. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. He's only able to get over that wall with their help. They're literally a team, and it works better that way. It's yep. it's very nice bit of Ludo narrative assonance, uh, as yes, we indeed. could say. Ho ho ho! Anyway, good game design. Yeah. Oh, ho, ho, ho. oh yeah. yeah. I suppose <laughs> in layman's terms. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> yes. Okay. So we we get the final sequence of the game. Um, all the treasure of Libertali is loaded onto Henry Avery's ship as he's about to leave, and then we get onto the boat. Sam has been pinned under a wooden beam by Rafe, who's on the ship, and Nate shows up, and then this other character, Nadine Ross, uh, is like, I'm the f*** out of here, uh, and says, hey, Rafe, you see those you see those two guys over there? You see the, the, those two skeletons? And Rafe is like, what? It's a couple skeletons. What's the big deal? And uh, Nadine says, I'm not, you know, so much into the history as you boys, but I know from context clues who those guys are, and you see it's Henry Avery and Thomas too, mm. stabbed each other to death with swords, fighting over the last of the treasure, so no one gets it. And then there's this big sequence where Rafe and Nate fight, and then yada yada, uh, it's a fight, swords, very dramatic. Uh, the way that Nate finally wins, he's on the ropes, his you know, back's on the ground, and he cuts a rope that a bunch of treasure is hanging from, and this like big ball of treasure just crushes Rafe instantly. So Rafe is literally crushed under the metaphorical and literal weight uh -huh. <laughs> of his ambition for the treasure. Very on the nose, but you know, it's it's clean, it's good, I like it a lot. <laughs> and he rescues Sam, they get out of there, uh, they, they finally uh, make it out. And then they go back home. They have this kind of like, you know, talking to each other scene afterwards, you know, debrief, like, oh, gosh, crazy. Nate tells Sam, who's feeling like, yeah, I found the treasure and that's all I wanted to do. And I was literally willing to die under there to make sure that you got out. And you saved me, obviously. Thank you. But I, I have this, this empty feeling inside I don't really know what to do with. And Nate says, you know, that's, that's what happens every time. But sometimes you got to choose what you're going to keep and what you're going to let go. And when he says what you're going to keep, he looks over towards Elena. So uh -huh. it's like, it's not just the treasure hunting. It's more about people, too. Yeah. And then uh, finally, the second kind of like after climax scene cuts back to Drake at his day job back at home. And the reveal is that Elena bought Jameson Marine, the shipping company that, that Nate, or the, the scrapping company that Nate works for, mm -hmm. with the help of some pirate doubloons that Sam kindly put pocketed into Elena's jacket. Because at the end, even though the city always gets destroyed, all the treasure's <laughs> lost, there's like, there's like five little tokens left that, you know, Sully or someone manages to scrape out of there, so. Uh, I like the idea of, like, <laughs> Sam stuck under the beam, like, with Rafe over him with a pirate sword, but he's still, like, shoveling coins in his pocket <laughs> just in case. Basically! <laughs> basically, yeah, the whole fight sequence when the eyes were off of him, yeah. he had time. Just like, okay, all right, I should get out of here, or... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's it's very sweet. And Elena says, like, here's the deal. We were doing well, but in our attempts to lead a normal life, we may have oversteered. Yeah. And she says, I, I missed the adventure. I missed us. So her plan is that she's going to buy the shipping company. She got the permits to do the Malaysia job so they can do it legally. No shooting anyone. <laughs> uh, she says that the only shooting is going to be done by me with my very expensive camera. So she says, I'm going to use these pirate doubloons <laughs> to buy a bunch of really expensive photography and uh, video equipment, restart her old show, and then go, you know, adventuring and, you know, diving for stuff with Nate in a, a thematic return to what Uncharted 1 started with, was, you know, diving for the coffin of Sir Francis Drake for right. Elena's travel show. So she's restarting that and kind of bringing them back to the part of the relationship that was most fundamental and most meaningful, which is the adventure, and, and bringing that back into their lives with the help of those pirate coins that they got. And Nate says, you know, it's not going to be easy, you know, and Elena says, nothing worthwhile is. Hmm. But then they joke about, like, oh, well, who's going to do the paperwork? And Nate says, well, I don't want to do it. And Elena <laughs> says, I don't want to do it. And so they say, oh, I'll play you for it. Hey. Um, and then it cuts back to uh, Crash Bandicoot <laughs> from earlier uh, in the game, but it is notably a different background. And instead of Nate and Elena sh talking each other like they were earlier on, it's completely silent. When you finish the section of the game, the camera pans around to reveal their Hello. daughter, Cassandra Drake, <laughs> aka Cassie. And this epilogue is an extended sequence where you get to wander around as Cassie, Nate and Elena's beach house, where they have a bunch of more like overtly historical stuff kind of out and about. There's mm -hmm. like maps by Aladrisi that were up in the attic that are on the walls now. And Aww. there's journals with notes from Sully of him and Sam in Cuba. And Sully's like, I've been off of cigars for a year and I'm in Cuba for God's sakes. <laughs> uh, and it's, it, you get to see kind of like the epilogue of how everybody's doing. And it's very sweet and very touching. And then you go 
to this other little side house because uh, Nate and Elena aren't there. So Cassie's like, hello, where are mm-hmm. you guys? And the, uh, you see this magazine that's like Adventure Life or whatever, and it says it runs in the family, you know, little Cassandra Drake. Um, so clearly Nate and Elena are established characters, kind of like, a, mm. uh, you know, Rick Steves types or some such. Right. But when she picks up the magazine, she sees that there are keys underneath, like, oh, dad's keys. Oh my God, dad's keys. And she turns <laughs> to this armoire, this locked thing that apparently she's never supposed to go into. And being the good little treasure hunter that she is, <laughs> she, you know, opens it up, looks inside, and there's all these artifacts from the first, I guess now, four Uncharted games, where it's the the cross of, of uh, St. Dismas, there's uh, the crystal skull from Uncharted 1, mm. there's uh, some resin, there's, like, all the little little artifacts and stuff <laughs> is, is in here. I'm just imagining, like, like a little post-it on the resin that's like, do not lick <laughs> under any yeah. circumstances. <laughs> yeah. El Dorado no Gold, do not open this jar. <laughs> no, seriously, yeah. don't. <laughs> yeah. So w- one of the things that she finds is a photograph from uh, the end of Uncharted 1, which exists like canonically in universe, we've seen it before, of Nate and Elena and Sully sitting on this pile of gold that, that Sully managed to come out with at the end of Uncharted 1. Yeah. And she's like looking at all this stuff and then it's like, oh, shit. the door opens and then Nate and Elena walk in like, hey, we were looking for you. Boat's all ready to go. Like, come on, let's get to it. And then uh, Cassie, who like closes the door, but the book is still out on the table behind her like that she's covering up. She's <laughs> like, oh, yeah, uh, you guys go on without me. Classic Drake attempts to deflect, but yeah. does not work. So Nate is like, OK, what's going on? So Cassie says, OK, don't be mad. But and then she steps away and reveals the book. And Nate is like, oh my god, she's like, hey, I said don't get mad. So it's very cute, a very classic uh, Drake family banter. Yeah. And either Drake or Elena, or Nate or Elena says, what did you see? And Cassie's like, oh, well, I mean, it's just some some sh** in the closet and, uh, you know, this picture. And they're like, language, oh, sorry. Uh, so she's like, it's just this photograph of you and mom and Sully and gold. It looks like Spanish gold. <laughs> And shotguns? And they're like, oh, geez, okay. So they have this moment where they're like, are we going to have to tell her? Like, are we going to have the talk? Um, and Nate's like, I don't think I'm ready for this. And Cassie's like, like, what the sh- are you guys talking about? And then they're like, hey, language. She's like, sorry, crap. And Nate says better, which is cute because Nate's catchphrase is like, crap. Yeah. So when she says crap and Nate's like better, it's a double meanings there. Cheeky, cheeky. So they... they finally decide like, okay, we're gonna tell her about this. Uh, We're gonna lay it all out. So even though Nate and Elena are now fully open with each other Mm -hmm. and you know, everything is, is, uh, everything is known and spoken between them, they have to, you know, cross the final threshold of bringing their daughter into that mix and revealing everything to her so that they can be a full family unit who is on the same page and understanding everything. And it's it's a very, very sweet moment. The banter is good. It's like <laughs> the kind of thing you love to see in an epilogue where it's it is a happy ending that is fully earned and meaningful on basically every level that you could hope for. Yeah. And the way that it it like completely ends is Drake starts telling the story of Uncharted One to his daughter, and he says, you know what? Uh hey, the uh, weather's great, got the boats all ready. Let's continue the story out on the water. So he leads Cassie out, telling her the story of El Dorado. Where it's like, yeah, so we were uh, we were going out to find uh, El Dorado, but it wasn't a city of gold; it was a statue, yeah, a cursed statue. She's like, no <laughs> way. He's like, yeah, no, you bet. So it's very sweet. She's immediately engrossed in the story. Yeah, Aww. it's 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 very fun. It's it's very wholesome. And the camera lingers on Elena, who watches them leave, and then she goes back inside and places the photo of of her, Nate, and Sully back on the book next to the photograph of Nate and Sam as kids. Underneath all of that from the book is the text from Sir Francis Drake's ring, Sic Parvis Magna, Mm. Greatness from Small Beginnings, that just pulls absolutely everything together. And it is so utterly beautiful of a final image for a video game where it's not only like, here he is then, here he is now. Yeah. All of the people that have loved Nathan and been part of the Drake family you know, from from game one to to game four, but then also kind of this recognition going back to a photo from Uncharted 1, where it's also a celebration of all of the games and giving thanks for the the 10 years, or I guess nine years, of of working on that series, celebrating all of the characters who made it so wonderful and beloved. It's such a nice 
not just a shot reverse shot of of the brothers and then them as as adults in Uncharted One, but specifically with Sick Parwis Magna, greatness from small beginnings, tying yeah. it all together thematically with the line and the ring that goes back to the first game, all pulling every last scrap of story together into it. It culminates the story of Nate and Elena, and it culminates the the best ending of a video game that I know of. <laughs> well done, Naughty Dog. Truly a masterpiece of game storytelling. Yeah, that's a really good way to tie everything together and make it feel satisfying for the characters and the players at the same time. Um, because I, I feel like they sort of do something very clever where the ending is kind of like, hey, we're not going to get any more Uncharted games like we've had before. Like, you cannot just be like, ah, forget that. Nathan Drake's going to go jump on more things that fall apart. Um, <laughs> it's more like, but in the long term, I don't know, Cassie Drake, Uncharted 5? Yeah. Uh, I mean, like, there's... I don't think they're working on it, no, but no, you know, no, no, it leaves no. the door open. The That's adventure exactly continues. it. What it is, it's exactly it. It's an Adventure Continues ending, which is my favorite kind of ending, because what I uh, I actually hadn't remembered that, like, their, uh, their happy ending of the game included, like, hey, maybe we should do a little bit more adventure, like, legally this time. Yeah. Because when I was talking about it, I was like, yeah, you know, it's very clear that, like, the, the happy ending they have at the beginning of the game that's not right for Nathan Drake and then like as I was saying it I was like I hope they actually intentionally resolve that because there are a lot of stories that just kind of be like doesn't matter how wild and crazy this character is their happy ending is a heterosexual marriage in a house with a picket fence and 2.5 <laughs> children so I, as I was saying it I was like man I hope they like you know bring that home actually instead of just Nathan being like okay this time for sure I'm done with adventuring and then they did it they did the thing that I wanted them to do and I think that's really sweet and special yeah it's it's so good it like I, I say at the top of the slide it's it's everything and more hmm. i didn't remember that it ends with this shot ah. uh, i was watching back through a bunch of it and playing through uh some of uncharted 4 to to prep for this and i i knew that there was the epilogue with you know opening up the closet of all the stuff and telling the stories but i didn't remember that elena takes the photograph goes back puts it on the book and then we linger on that and then cut to black that's the end of the game that, that got me when I watched it. Like, oh, that's good. That's Aww. good, man. So it's, uh, it's, it's my favorite love story in video games that really commits to telling a story of not just two people falling in love insofar as action heroes and assigned woman fall in <laughs> love. Really, they just kiss and that's it. Mm. But it is the story of two people who are in love, learning to love each other more and better and more honestly and deeply. And I, I just find that really, really cool that they actually shot for that and then nailed it. Yeah. That's crazy. We don't <laughs> see stuff like that all that often. <laughs> no, I mean, it's hard enough to write an ending. Like, the, I'm sure the other videos in this um, playlist are going to be, you know, illustrations of other extremely well done endings, but it is very hard to wrap up every thread in a story in a way that actually yeah. feels, like, satisfying. And in this case, like, you know, a, a less competent writing team might have been like, Nathan Drake's only recourse is to perish heroically as, as he is a man who will never truly be satisfied and instead they're like that he's gonna get a, a functional happy marriage and a, a kid who is exactly as much of a problem as he is but significantly yep. less traumatized about it and it's gonna be yeah. great and uh and like sam the fact that sam survives and gets to hang yeah. out with sully that's really sweet like sam has two different fake out deaths in this game i think yeah like oh he oh no he got shot and then it's like ah, he's fine don't worry about it he's he's okay it was just a, a cosmetic <laughs> bullet wound it's like oh yeah. all right cool and he's probably the easiest character where the game could have just cleanly killed him off. And instead they were like, no, he gets to get his shit together and, and slowly rebuild his life, mostly by hanging out with Sully, the world's most patient man. Yeah, honestly. <laughs> and they do. That's earned because when they're in the boat, uh, he's pinned down and he's saying like, Nate, leave. Uh -huh. I got to find the treasure with you. I'm satisfied. I got to, to have my big adventure with my brother. Like... Clearly, I'm going to die. <laughs> That's fine. I want to make sure that you go. And then Nate still looks for the way to save him. And then mm -hmm. it's a very earned um, sequence. So they they know the trope is that it would be easier to just kill off Sam. Yep. But they know how to go one step further than that and get a more meaningful ending uh, in mm -hmm. the long run. For all the 
stuff I said about like, yeah, you know, F Cassie Drake, future protagonist. I really respect that they haven't made any noises about doing more Uncharted games. Like, this was an ending. Like, this isn't yeah. a, oh, you know, maybe we could do more stuff. This is like uh, Nathan Drake and Elena, uh, Elena are like doing their own thing. Like, they, they had their adventures. They're done with those kinds of adventures. There may be, they have a future, but we're not necessarily going to get to participate in it. And it it takes a lot of guts to end something, especially a long running franchise that has been incredibly yeah. successful and lucrative. Like we all have been seeing this more and more in recent years, mm -hmm. series that go on <laughs> far too long, uh, franchises that won't die or or you know caveat their happy endings with sequel hooks to to keep people coming back for more and paying them and stuff like that. So the fact that this is such a good and satisfying ending and in the last eight years, right? They haven't done anything just to, to like undo it or continue it. I think yeah. that's really powerful because again, you're going to see a lot of other videos in this playlist that have thoughts on, uh, you know, what it takes to end a story in a satisfying manner. And the first step is courage because ending a story yeah. and letting it stay over is one of the scariest things in the world for any artist. So yeah. They, yeah. they do have another game called Lost Legacy, which is with Chloe Frazier and Nadine Ross from Uncharted right. 4. And Sam Drake does make a cameo. And it's actually cool to see he's much <laughs> more, like, comfortable around people oh, in that's that good. game. Uh, Nate and Elena do not show up, but it's nice to be like, the, the adventure does continue. There are other characters in this world, and they could make another one of those if they wanted. I don't know if they want to. I don't mm. think they will. But to your point, going back to the games from 2007... A lot of these game franchises just kind of flamed out mm. or tried to do too much and just kept going. Not a lot of them had the courage to be like, hey, we're done. <laughs> we're telling our story. We told our story. We're done. Yep. And boy, oh boy, do I respect that. Yeah. So uh, this concludes my <laughs> stealth sequel to the Spider-Man Detail Diatribe, the Detail Diatribe duology of boys being stuck in their own heads, distracted by their obsessions, and pushing away the people who love them the most until they finally acknowledge their <laughs> screw-up, realize they need to be present for the people who care for them, resolve to be better, and put in the work to reciprocate that love and make it right. hey -oh. That's good story design! Yeah! <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm glad that, like... Nathan Drake doesn't get his own symbiote arc where he's like, I'm going to get worse on purpose because it's much funnier because <laughs> whenever he f***s up, he's like, oh no, I f***ed up. I, I'm, I'm so sorry. What should I do? Do you want me to like cut off my hand or something? And they're always like, Jesus Christ, dial it back, man. <laughs> Just stop doing it. <laughs> it's good. It's I, good, yeah. I love this game so much and and I, I knew that it was one of my favorite games of all time, but, but going through it again for this, I'm like, oh no. No, no, this is one of the best games ever made. Yeah. Like, holy hell. If you haven't played it, it's not too late. You can still play it. The story's <laughs> still good. It doesn't rely on fake outs or, you know, plot twists or anything. It's just it's just a good story that mm -hmm. you notice more details in every time you go through it. I think that it's really cool that uh, the gameplay has generally very little to do with the story. Like, you pilot around Nathan Drake and, you know, you shoot his gun and stuff. But for the most part, the story of the game will play out in its own way no matter what you do, which I, I think is fun because it means that the characters get to be really true to who they are. And it's kind of like you're just riding along with Nathan Drake as he's doing this. Because I know that the Uncharted team was like, we want to make this feel like a movie. I think that they succeeded because this feels like the grand finale to a movie franchise, you know, in that it is a big, bombastic, and yet deeply emotionally satisfying ending to an arc that we've seen play out in these four games. But, like, they they don't gamify the parts of it that are plot so much. I will say they, they do a really good job of exercising restraint in this game because mm -hmm. the intro sequence is slow. Yeah. You don't fire a gun until like three or four hours in, depending on how you play it. We don't fire uh, a real gun. I mean, gun. except for the very, very beginning. Yeah, not, not a real gun, of course. Yeah. Um, but uh, they're, they're willing to withhold the action and adventure for a while so that when you actually do get to that point, it's like, oh, this is fun. Mm -hmm. This is exciting. This feels good. And then you are in Nate's shoes where you're like, oh, yeah, it's been a while since I've had the adrenaline running. <laughs> this is really, really enticing. And you get to play along with Drake getting sucked back into this world of adventure. Dunkey described it as you are along for the ride of this man ruining his marriage by cosplaying <laughs> Indiana Jones. <laughs> but yeah, that's the thing. Like, you're, you're along for the ride. Practically speaking, you can do nothing to stop Nathan Drake from doing his dumb sh**. Like, you're, you're just sort of helping out, which I think is fun. I, I think that this is, um... 
a very powerful perspective to have in a game because there are a lot of games where it's like the plot's going to happen regardless and there are a lot of games where it's like the plot will happen but I'm still going to make you push the buttons to make the plot happen like failure is your only option but I'm still going to make you push the button that makes you fail <laughs> and then you have the ones where it's like it's completely player driven you know you can do whatever you want the plot will adapt you, uh, multiple endings and I, I kind of respect that this game was like we're not going to do that we're, this is going to be the ending there's not going to be a true ending or a bad ending you're just going to experience it. Yeah. And whether or not that makes it a solid uh, game experience is mostly defined by how fun the gameplay actually is. And the gameplay is fun. It's, it's really like, fun. It's exciting. It's the, it's the most fun of all of all four of them. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, for ages, people were like, oh, you know, I feel like Uncharted would, like, make a better movie series or, like, a TV show than a game. And it's like, well, I mean, <clears throat> finger curls <laughs> on the monkey's paw. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Turns out part of what makes it fun is that you are following around Nathan Drake and you do get inside his head. And that is harder to do in, like, a movie yeah. Evidently, <laughs> <laughs> apparently, I'll link the uh, the Nathan Fillion fan movie from uh, 2018. Oh, that one's because fun because that is I watched it back the other day. It's so fun. It's yeah. so lovingly made. It is not as good as the games because there is something so special to playing the games. Mm -hmm. But as a like representation on film. It is really, really exciting to watch through. So if you haven't seen that, it's definitely worth your time. Yeah, it's really uh, We got cute. a lot of stuff to link down in this video. <laughs> but uh, Red, if there's nothing else that we want to say, then we might be about sorted. Well, I did want to say to keep an eye on the letterboxing in the Nathan uh, Fillion fan film because they yeah. do some cute things with it to transition from quote-unquote cutscene to quote-unquote gameplay. It's really fun. It's just clearly made with a lot of love, as is Uncharted 4. And clearly, they were like, this is going to be the last one. We're calling it A Thief's End. We're not going to be yeah. like Uncharted 5. A Thief comes back for seconds. Like, come on. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thief of Revengeance. Ah, <laughs> oh, god damn it. Yeah, no, I, I think that this has successfully convinced me that Uncharted 4 is really, really good. I already knew it was fun, but this is like a, this is a different level of like, oh, the themes, the, the writing, <laughs> the yeah. narrative. So I have successfully proven that Uncharted 4 has the best ending, but go watch the other videos in the playlist as well, because uh, we'll let them try to dethrone <laughs> Uncharted 4. <laughs> oh, man. Yes. All right. I think that's us basically done. Basically. So, uh, uh bye. bye. <laughs> uh. Good work, team. <laughs>